Uh, my name is uh, Ian Lloyd. I'm the Senior Director for Pharma Projects, uh, uh, which is Informer's database of drugs in R&D. I've actually worked on Pharma Projects for over 30 years, so uh, I know quite a lot about uh, the information in the database. And every year since about 1993, I've produced uh, an annual report looking at trends in research and development. So taking a cut of the database as it is and comparing it to the previous year. Uh, hopefully some people in this room will have heard of it and, and uh, have read it in previous years. Uh, next year's report will be published next week and will be available for a free download via our website. So I encourage you to do that but I'm going to give you a world exclusive preview of some of the findings of the report this afternoon. So here is my agenda for this afternoon. I'm going to spend probably just over half of the, of the talk talking about the drug R&D pipeline in 2018 and how it's changing, which is based on the data in formal projects. Then I'll spend a little time talking about trends in clinical trials in 2018 based on Informa's uh, flagship product, Trial Trove, and some information too from Site Trove. And then I have a, just a little piece at the end uh, looking at what to expect in the year ahead, um, some hot issues and some hot drugs to look out for. So firstly, the drug R&D pipeline in 2018 and how it's changing. So we start off with, if you like, the headline figure, the total number of drugs in the pipeline at the start of 2018. And here by pipeline, we mean all drugs from preclinical stages through phase one, phase two, and phase three, through the pre-registration phases, and up to and including launched. Um, the pipeline as we count it does include drugs which are launched, but are still being developed for further indications and in additional countries. Once they've got to the stage where they are what we call fully launched, we then remove them. So this, this figure does include some launch drugs. And you can see on the right-hand side the 2018 figure, 1, 000, uh, sorry, 15,267. And as you can see, the number has increased every year pretty much since the start of the millennium. And is certainly a lot, lot higher than it was in 2001, where it's around the 6,000 mark. However... The uh, increase year on year this year is just 2.7%, the pipeline expansion rate, and that is well down on the rate we saw in the previous year, which was 8.4%. Now, there, there, are, there are some internal reasons for, for this. Uh, in the past year, we've taken um, extra measures to ensure that we review the, the information on our database more regularly, and sometimes this results in us deciding that a drug looks like it's no longer in development, in which case we move it out of this data set. And we've done, been a bit more rigorous doing this in the past year, so this may have slightly suppressed the overall figures. Um, but given the number of drugs we've added to the database, uh, I think uh, what you can see is there's definitely still expansion in the pipeline. It's just a little harder to determine exactly what this might be. Um, and the other thing to note is, of course, an ever-expanding pipeline is not necessarily a great thing um, because most of what we're talking about here is drugs in the, the pre-launch stages, so that's a cost. So really, um, having a bigger pipeline is only a great thing if it's producing more drugs. So let's quickly look at and see how the past year was by that measure. Um, so what I always do after my main report is I produce what I call, we call the New Active Substances Supplement, where we take a look at all of the drugs which were launched for the first time in the past year. So the figures for 2017 are at the moment slightly preliminary, but again, I hope you can see on the right-hand side there were 46 new uh, molecular entities and five vaccine launches for the first time in 2017. Uh, this already makes it the second best year that we've seen in, uh, since 2000. Um, the figure may go up one or two uh, uh, as we kind of uh, finesse the figures. We, might, we like to make sure we have a, an absolutely robust set of drugs and it can be sometimes difficult to, de to determine whether a drug which has been approved, whether it's actually uh, launched, particularly in some of the, the more obscure markets. But, Generally speaking, I think it's looking like uh, 2017 was a good year, which is good news. 
Um, so just to highlight a few of the, the new drug launches in 2017, because I think as well as a good year in terms of numbers, it was a good year in terms of quality as well, some interesting new drugs. So first of all, we had the first two CAR-T cell therapies launched, uh, Novartis's Kimria and Gilead's Yaskata. Uh, Yaskata in the USA for relapsed or refractory large B-cell lymphoma after two or more lines of systemic therapy, including diffuse large cell uh, DLBCL. And uh, Kimria in the USA for B-cell precursor acute lymphocytic leukemia, that is refractory or, sec uh, or in second or later relapse. We also had the first uh, uh, US approval for a gene therapy in the shape of Spark Therapeutics Lux Turner. Uh, the launch for this is still pending, but it uh, definitely was approved last year. And Lux Turner was approved in the US for RPE65 mutation associated retinal dystrophy, which is an ophthalmological indication. So very significant, I think, to get the first gene therapy approved in the USA. Uh, we also had the first systemic therapy for atopic dermatitis in, the, uh, in Sanofi and Regeneron's Dupixent, which was launched in the USA and has been approved in both the EU and Japan. There was more success for immuno-oncology, which I'll be talking a bit about a bit later on as well, with AstraZeneca's Infinzi and Merck KGA and Fiverr's Bavencio. Uh, Infinzi was launched in the US for urothelial cancer and Bavencio for urothelial and the related Merkel cell carcinoma. GlaxoSmithKline looks to have a potential blockbuster on its hands with its new shingles vaccine, Shingrix. And lastly, Roche's Acrevus was launched for multiple sclerosis and actually had the biggest first year sales in recent years generating almost a billion dollars in its first nine months on the market. So that's good news. There were some good new drugs launched. Now actually, let's actually focus on the drugs in the pipeline. And our next slide gives you the, the breakdown by phase of development. So on the left-hand side, you see the preclinical moving through the clinical stages up to and including launched. And the, the pink bar gives you the 2017 figure and the, the, the uh, gray bar, the 2018 figure. So a couple of things to note here. Um, Preclinical drugs were up by 7.3%, and this is fueled by the addition of 3,807 drugs into farm projects over the year. So as I say, even though the pipeline expansion slowed, the fact that so many drugs are coming in suggests that there is some general uh, organic pipeline expansion still ongoing. Now you'll notice the, the launch figure fell by around 200. This was despite 100 new launches during the year. And what this means is that during our re review process, we actually moved uh, uh, 300 drugs from the, the launched but still active set into the launched and, and completed set. So this is probably one of the big reasons why the, the expansion number slowed slightly. Um, but I think where it's probably most interesting is to look at the, the phases in between. So let's look at the clinical stages in a little bit more detail. Here we have the number of drugs in the phase one stage, the phase two stage, and the phase three stage. And actually we're looking back to the start of the decade here. So what you can see here is the number of drugs in phase one is up slightly, up 3% uh, to 2,127 whereas the total number of drugs uh, in phase two was almost exactly the same. And for the first time, really, the number of drugs in phase three actually showed a slight decline of around 1.9%. Um, so whether this is concerning or not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, um, having lots of drugs in, tr in trials is a cost, but certainly I think we need to keep an eye on this figure and it'll be really inter interesting to return to this graph next year and see whether this is a blip whether it's, a, whether it's the start of a trend of a declining number of drugs in phase three. So overall, the quantity figure is looking flattish. What about the quality? So one of our sister products, Biometracker, um, which also tracks drugs in development, 
Uh, the analysts there give ratings to drugs based on their, their likelihood of success. And what they do is they look for milestones in drugs development, such as reporting of clinical trials, um, the uh, reports on, on drugs competitors. And from that, they make an adjustment to assess whether a drug is uh, less likely to be approved than the average of drugs for that kind, about the same, or more likely to be approved than the average of, of drugs of that kind. Uh, and, and here we have data again for 2018 and 2017. So the data hasn't changed that much uh, year on year for those at pre-registration. Um, there's a, those with a greater uh, percentage uh, chance of getting approved uh, slightly increased from 52.5% to 49.3%. However, however, there's also a, a larger number in those which have less uh, than average chance of approval. Uh, um, the trend that for that is reversed for drugs in phase three. But I think the main thing you can see from this graph is there's not a lot of change year on year. So this is something we've just been tracking in recent years. And again, it will be interesting to see what this data looks like once we've built up a picture over a number of years. We're now going to move to the uh, top pharma companies by pipeline size. And what you can see here is the top 10 pharma companies. And on the, the column to the furthest to the right, you can see the number of drugs which they originated. And then the other column gives you the total number of drugs, including those which they licensed in as well. So you can see that Novartis is at to number one for the second year, top of the charts. However, its actual number of drugs in its pipeline has declined by 28. Johnson & Johnson has risen to number two, uh, although the number of drugs uh, in, in its pipeline has only gone up very slightly. And the reason it has gone up is largely because it, it completed the acquisition of Octelian during 2017. Um, in fact, it's one of only two pharma companies which actually did increase the size of their pipelines, the other being the Japanese company Takeda. And the, the other thing to notice, I think, is um, the actual uh, contents of the top 10 are unchanged. It's the same companies that we saw last year. And this is something we've really noticed um, maybe 10, 20 years ago when there was a lot of major merger acquisition activity, the top 10 would change quite a lot. What we're seeing these days is the top 10 uh, is fairly stable and most of its acquisition activity is just acquiring small uh, companies with one or two drugs where they're really taking over a company to get their hands on a particular drug rather than being involved in um, expensive and potentially disruptive large uh, acquisition activity. And we'll hear more about deals from our next speaker later on. Uh, it's also instructive to replace that last column and see how well the, those top 10 companies did in terms of launching new drugs. Uh, so what you can see here on the, the right-hand side column is the number of new active substance launches each uh, company made during 2017. So the good news is, well, all, all of the top 10 launched at least one drug. And in fact, Novartis and Pfizer managed to launch an impressive four, and Merck and & Co. and AstraZeneca three. The interesting thing to note about this, I think, is if you look at the 2016 figures, that absolutely was not the case. In fact, there were uh, six of the top 10 who didn't manage to launch a single drug, which is obviously pretty concerning. So good to see that the top 10 had, had a better year in 2017. Here's the top 10 Japanese pharma companies by pipeline size. Um, uh, and so I'm sure there are people in this room who are working for, for these companies. And the thing to note here is, again, the top 10 hasn't changed, so it's pretty stable. How, uh, so Takeda increased its lead at the top of the charts from 141 drugs to 164. And unlike the international top 10, it's one of actually five pharma companies which increased their pipeline size. We're now going to look at the total number of companies uh, involved in R&D. Uh, and this is a, quite a spectacular change, I think you'll agree, since 2001. In 2001, there were 1,198 companies which were developing drugs. Uh, by 2018, this has skyrocketed to 4,134. Um, as with the overall drug numbers, the company numbers grew at a slower rate in 2018 just up 3.3%. Um, and 
That includes 618 new companies which entered R&D, went onto Farm Produce Database for the first time. So therefore we can work out that 487 must have dropped out. So that's quite a considerable rate of churn if, if you think of it percentage-wise. But certainly it does show how many more companies are involved in R&D these days than there were 20 years ago. So what we thought would be interesting to look at was how the complexion of the industry has changed. And I think this is a really interesting slide. Um, the, the pink line shows you the uh, percentage of the pipeline which the top 10 drugs have contributed by year. So you can see in 2011, the top 10 pharma companies were originating around 13% of all drugs in R&D. And by, by this year, that's fallen to 7%. That's quite a significant change. Uh, and then the, uh, the light purple line uh, gives you the same information for the top 25 companies. So again, in 2011, the top 25 companies were uh, providing nearly 19% of all drugs. And now this has fallen to getting close to 11%. So that's quite a big change. And then in contrast, if you look at the dark purple line, um, this shows the percentage of the pipeline which small companies with one or, two, one or two drugs have contributed. So this has been going up from around 15% in 2011 to around 19% uh, now. And there was a slight drop this year, but I think what this is, this is showing you is the, the proportion of drugs provided by the big companies is falling, and there's a proliferation of small companies which are actually providing a larger percentage of the overall pipeline. So it's a real kind of shift in the complexion of the industry. We next move to locations of pharma companies worldwide. Um, there's little change year on year here, and it's probably no surprise to see that in the pie charts here, the biggest section, the pink section, by a long way, is the US. So this shows us there are 48% of pharma companies uh, which are US-based. Um, little change, as I mentioned, just a, a rise of 1%. Um, China also increased by 1%. Europe fell by 1% and Canada by 1%. But it really does show just how, uh, how dominant the US is in the market still. Japan, interestingly, no change at uh, 3%. Uh, and the UK is currently still holding steady despite uncertainties about the, the vote to lead the European Union. So we're now going to move on to uh, different kinds of, of drugs. Uh, so this is giving you the R&D pipeline by the broad therapeutic areas, so areas such as anti-cancer, neurological, cardiovascular, etc. So in this graph, unlike the, the other graph, you will see some double counting because obviously drugs uh, can be classified under more than one therapeutic area. So for instance, an asthma drug could be counted in the immunological group as well as the respiratory group. So this is why the numbers will add up to greater than the, the total you saw earlier on. Um, well, so what's interesting to note is cancer is by far the biggest uh, category and also its rate of increase uh, exceeded the average increase. So cancer was up by 7.6%. That's almost three times the average pipeline expansion rate we saw earlier on of 2.7%. Uh, Anti-infectives came down by quite a significant 9.3%, and cardiovascular was also down by 7.2%. Neurologicals up around average at 2.4%. So I, I think the question is, um, is cancer taking an ever, ever bigger slice of the pie? So we took a look at that over the years. So this is giving you the percentage of all drugs in the pipeline which have at least one uh, cancer or oncological uh, indication. And you can see that in 2010, this is 26.8%, so just over a quarter. And by this year, it's risen to 34.1%, so over a third. So just take a moment to think about that. Over a third of all drugs in development have at least one cancer indication. That is a very, very dominant position for cancer to be in. And we can look at this a bit further. If we look at the top 10 individual diseases rather than the broad therapeutic area for which drugs are being developed. So this gives you the top 10 diseases or indications. You can see breast cancer at the top, but I think, again, that the interesting thing to note, I think, is for the first time, all of the top 10 are cancer diseases. And in fact, seven of the top 10 are cancer diseases. The top 10, breast cancer and non-small cell lung cancer 
also posted double digit uh, increases percentage wise. So 12.4% for breast cancer and 12.1% for non small cell lung cancer. Uh, also in the top five, ovarian cancer up by 12.4%. And we can look a little bit further back at the 11 to 25. And again, you see lots and lots of cancer indications. In fact, 15 of the top 25 uh, diseases now are cancer indications with the biggest increase being posted by acute myelogenous leukemia at 14.4%. Um, so what does this expansion into cancer come at the expense of? Well, interestingly, uh, three of the diseases which fall down the chart are all in the autoimmune area, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and asthma. We're now going to take a look at the mechanisms and targets against which drugs are being developed. So this gives you the top 10 mechanisms of action uh, in the Foreign Projects database. Um, we have a hierarchical classification. What does tend to happen is that drugs, when they're first identified, uh, the, we, we don't always know the precise um, mechanism or target. Sometimes it's uh, not actually discovered yet, and other, sometimes it's not disclosed. So this does tend to mean that the broader categories at the top of the hierarchy are somewhat overrepresented. Um, so you'll see at the top, immunostimulant uh, is by far, far the, the biggest category, which is a very broad category, and something that's applied to all vaccines, for example. Um, but the really interesting thing, I think, is uh, the number two position. So that anti-cancer immunotherapy is the, the, the name of the category that we give to all immuno-oncology drugs. So I mentioned them earlier on. Um, they increased this year by 50%, which obviously is absolutely massive. Um, in the previous year, that category increased by an even larger 123%. The actual rise in the number of candidates uh, for both of those years is quite similar up uh, 443 this year compared to 490 in the previous year. And interestingly, what you can see on the, the right-hand side is the percentage of drugs in each of these categories which are in the later stages of development, so pre-registered, registered or launched. And there's only 1.6% of, of those 1,332 which are currently at that stage. So clearly, although immuno-oncology is super hot at the moment, it's still, in some senses, a bit of a gamble. There are, there are, there are not many drugs uh, approved compared to the number which are in development. And number three, you'll see another broad category, which is actually a subset of the, the immuno-oncology uh, drugs, immune checkpoint inhibitor. So this is a category we created this year to aid with searching, and that goes straight in at number three. Uh, immune checkpoints uh, proteins include CD27, CD28, CD40, CD137, and OX40. Uh, and further down, just below the top 10, you'd also see uh, immune checkpoint stimulants as well. Um, so interestingly, for the top uh, 10 mechanisms of action, all but one are, can have some cancer component. The only one which doesn't is the number nine, the opioid mu, mu receptor agonists, which are involved in pain. However, if we look at the actual individual uh, drug protein targets, the picture is slightly different. Here, the opioid mu1 receptor comes out on top. So this is the single most common protein against which drugs are being developed. Um, and there are, there are fewer cancer categories in this top 10. You'll notice at number four and at number five, glucocor glucocorticoid receptor and tumor necrosis factor are both uh, uh, infl inflammation targets. So I think this also, what this is also showing is just the breadth and diversity of, of cancer targets, which are um, part of the, the number of, of cancer drugs. So even though it's by far the, the top in, in therapeutic and disease terms, it doesn't necessarily contribute the, the so many top, top tens to the, the targets. Um, individual targets involved in immune oncology are starting uh, to make it into the top 25 this year. We see CD19 at number 15, Program cell death, or PD-1, at number 17, and CD274, also known as PDL one at number 18. Another thing we, we always like to measure every year is uh, to take a look at the, the number of individual uh, drug protein targets which have been identified for the first time. So the first time that there's been a drug in the pipeline hitting this particular target. So in 2017, we identified 75 new targets for which drugs were being developed for the first time. 
Interestingly, this is somewhat worse than uh, 2016 with 116 and 2015 with 113. Also, the number of targets against which drugs are being developed fell slightly from 1672 to 1657. So this is maybe something uh, uh, slightly less good news, that the, the, if you like, the innovation index for 2017 wasn't so great. One thing which is definitely happening and has been happening over the 20 year period you see in this graph is the move into, or into biologicals. So what you see here is the pipeline split up uh, into the, the, the grey bars, which includes all of the small molecules, new chemical entities, natural products, etc. And the pink bars are the biologicals. So these would be the recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, cell therapies, gene therapies, all that kind of thing. And again, you can see there's been a really significant change in the past 20 years from just over 15% of the pipeline being biologicals uh, in 1995 to, to this year, we're now up at 37.9% of the pipeline being biological, so nearly 40%, although the increase this year was only 0.1%, but it has more than doubled in 20 years. Um, it'd be really interesting to see where this kind of levels out, whether this is going to carry on going up, or whether the fact that biologicals are by their nature uh, less um, pleasant for patients to take because they're generally injectable, whether this will hold this back. One thing that's definitely a big trend in the industry for recent years is to develop uh, drugs against rare diseases. Um, we now have 4,615 drugs, or 30% of the pipeline, under development for at least one rare disease. Um, and here you can see an indication of this, the number of orphan drug designations granted each year and the number of expedited review statuses granted each year. And you can see this is, this is going, going in one direction, which is up. So that's my review of the current pipeline. I just want to summarize before I move on the key findings. So the R&D pipeline is still growing, although the growth rate has slowed. 2017 looks like it was a good year for new drug launches uh, with some notable firsts. There was little change in the numbers of drugs at the clinical stages, either in quantity or quality. The top 10 pharma companies all delivered new drugs, but their share of the overall pipeline is in decline. Cancer is now taking over a third of all pipeline drugs and all of the top five indications. And related to that, the immune oncology boom shows no sign of ending. Biologicals have now advanced towards almost 40% of the R&D portfolio. And companies are still focusing on rare diseases despite apparently stumbling innovation levels. So I'm now going to uh, move from looking at uh, figures all based around drugs to figures based around individual clinical trials. So most of this information comes from uh, our uh, R&D uh, clinical trials database, Trial Trove. So again, we can split out uh, the clinical trials by therapeutic area. Uh, and what you can see here is the, the different therapeutic areas, oncology to the left, metabolic, CNS, uh, all the way across. So here, oncology has an even more significant advantage. In fact, 300% uh, more ongoing trials than any other therapeutic area. And this is probably because oncology drugs, by nature of uh, cancer drug development, tend to go in, into multiple different trials looking at different, different cancers. So, so it does kind of make sense. Uh, again, splitting by therapeutic area, we can look at the number of clinical trial starts by year to get a sense of where the, the, the activity is being uh, focused. And again, oncology is at the top. It's shown an increasing trend um, and uh, a, a spike in 2017, although most of the therapeutic areas do show a, a similar sort of upward trend. breaking the uh, clinical trial landscape down by country next. Uh, so once again, we see the US uh, is, is, is heavily dominant. In fact, around 30% of the total clinical trials in the, in the world uh, are, are in the US, uh, followed by China, Germany, United Kingdom, France, Spain, Canada, uh, Japan at number eight, Italy, and then Russia. 
And, and those nine countries after the US are accounting for a further 6.9%, 6 to 9% of the uh, current clinical trials being conducted in the world. It's also instructive to look at the average of uh, duration of phase three clinical trials uh, uh, in, in months. And what you can see here is again the pink bar, uh, the number of months in uh, the enrollment period, and the grey bar, the, the number, uh, the actual study period. And again, you can see oncology trials uh, average by far the longest trial duration, uh, over four years in total, uh, compared to other uh, therapeutic areas. Uh, and this is really, be, again, because of the, of the need to demonstrate clear survival benefit uh, in a cancer clinical trial. Whereas, for instance, at the other end of the scale, you have vaccine trials where you give a vaccine, you challenge with the infectious disease agent, and it's pretty clear quickly whether the, the vaccine has worked or not because the patient either becomes infected or they don't. Uh, CNS and cardiovascular trials have the second and third just long trial durations. Uh, some data specific to Asia here. Uh, we have the top 10 diseases for clinical trials in Asia on the left-hand side with non-small cell lung cancer at the top uh, with the greatest number of ongoing trials in Asia, around 450, uh, followed by type 2 diabetes and breast cancer. Uh, China, Japan and South Korea are the top three countries in Asia which are currently conducting clinical trials as, as the pie chart shows. Uh, and just some data from uh, Citrove, our database of sites and investigators now. Um, this is showing you the number of investigators in Asia involved in ongoing trials by therapeutic area. So the pink bar is giving you Asia as a whole, and then you're seeing uh, China with the grey bar, uh, Japan with the dark purple bar, and South Korea with the, with the mauve bar. Uh, so the greatest number of investigators in Asia, uh, 4,500, are involved in oncology, followed by metabolic diseases and cardiovascular diseases at close to 3,000 each. So that's a very, very quick overview of uh, what's happening in clinical trials at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to round off by giving you uh, some things to look out for really in the pharmaceutical industry uh, in 2018. And firstly, uh, some drugs which were approved in 2017, which are due for early launch in 2018. So I mentioned already Spark Therapeutics Luxterna for the ophthalmological uh, uh, gene uh, disease. Um, that's expected uh, to launch in Q3, sorry, Q1. Uh, Pfizer's Steglatro in type 2 diabetes launched due uh, February this year, so imminently. And also in type 2 diabetes, uh, no Novo Nordisk's uh, Ozempic, uh, which uh, was approved in both the USA and the EU. Uh, approval is expected in Q1, um, and it's been filed in Japan as well. Erie Pharmaceuticals Ropressa for glaucoma, that's launched, uh, that launches due for that in mid-2018. And what about uh, drugs which we're expecting to see approved in 2018? Uh, so our colleagues in Scrip reviewed the, the landscape for late stage and drugs which are awaiting approval and selected the, the, the drugs which they thought were the most exciting. And I've done a summary of some of them here for you. So one big area is the new uh, kind of um, anti-CGRP monoclonals for migraine prophylaxis. And there are three expected to be approved during 2018. Uh, uh, Amgen and Novartis' Amovig has a review date at the FDA of 17th of May. Um, uh, and uh, this is interesting because it targets the CGRP receptor as opposed to the ligand. Uh, Tevez Fremenezumab, uh, its differentiating feature is its potential for quarterly dosing as opposed to, to monthly dosing. So that could give it a real advantage. That's due for review uh, in the middle of June. And then Lily's galkinezumab is due in October. Uh, in the HIV area, which uh, probably took a bit of a dip in recent years, um, but it's uh, had a bit of a renaissance recently, uh, Gilead's Bictavi, uh, in which a new drug, Bictegravir, is paired in a fixed-dose combination with emtricitabine and tenofovir. Um, in fact, since this, uh, I started producing these slides, 
Uh, they, beat, they beat me to it, and this drug has already been approved uh, on the 7th of February. And this is a really important drug for Gilead. Um, it's facing patent expiries for a number of its uh, HIV combinations, and it's also finding that after its massive success it, with its hepatitis C franchise, as the number of patients is declining, that sales are declining there. So it's really important that uh, Gilead gets a, a good s a slice of the HIV market here. Um, another different kind of HIV drug is Ibilizumab from Thera Technologies and Timed Biologics. So this is for salvage therapy in patients who can no longer tolerate or are no longer um, re um, responding to existing, existing HIV medications. Uh, it's a monoclonal antibody and therefore it's um, injectable, but since these patients didn't, uh, have run out of options, it still potentially could be a very big, big drug. Uh, AbbVie has uh, Elagalix el for e uh, endometriosis and uterine, uterine fibro fibroids due in the 4th of May. Rigel has uh, Tavalis for immune thrombocytopenic purpura, which is due for review 17th of April. Johnson & Johnson uh, also beat me to on, uh, on the slides with apalutamide. was approved just last week for non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And Merck and Co. has a tildrakizumab for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis, which is uh, also due to be approved this spring. Uh, what else to look out for in 2018 in terms of drugs? Uh, so, again, the team reviewed uh, some important phase three trial results, which are expected to, to uh, be of interest this year. In the oncology sphere, we have PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors and CTLA-4 inhibitors um, starting to be approved or giving phase three readouts for indications beyond their initial indications of melanoma. AstraZeneca's study of Infinzi with tremolimumab in non-small cell lung cancer is expected to report. Bristol Myers Squibb study of Opdivo with Yervoy also in non-small cell lung cancer also should be big news this year. And the phase three ECHO 301 trial of Merck and Co's Keytruda in combination with the IDO inhibitor Epacadustat. Uh, also in the oncology arena, uh, but a slightly different kind of drug, is vascular biogenics gene therapy, Ofrenergine opadenovec, uh, which is in development for glioblastoma multiforme, the, 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 the rare form of brain cancer. Ooh. In neuroscience, uh, further phase three trial readouts in Alzheimer's and Huntington's are expected. Roche's amyloid targeting credizumab and gantanerumab, these drug names are quite difficult to say, <laughs> to say uh, are expected to report in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, VTV therapeutics rage inhibitor az azaliragon in Alzheimer's disease is also expected first results in the steadfast trial uh, due this year, and RAGE is a, a new target receptor for advanced glycation and products, and it's implicated in the amyloid beta aggregation and a tau fibril formation uh, um, pathway. Um, it has a US fast track, so uh, obviously, as I'm sure you know, Alzheimer's disease has had a bit of a rough uh, few years with lots of phase three trials uh, providing negative res results and lots of people are actually starting to question the amyloid hypothesis, so whether or not we're actually targeting the right area here. So I think this could be a key year for, for this therapeutic area. We'll see what happens with these phase three drugs. Uh, also in neuroscience, Johnson & Johnson's esketamine for treatment resistant depression uh, is due to report in six phase three trials. And this is a really interesting drug. It's actually based on the recreational drug ketamine, but the, 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 the derivative uh, is believed to have uh, activity in treatment-resistant depression, which is, which is by definition very difficult to, to treat. In the cardiometabolic area, Esperion's bempodoic acid, uh, reporting results in elevated LDL cholesterol as an add-on to ezetimibe. 
And then just looking slightly beyond the, the, the drugs, what are the issues which the industry uh, is likely to face this year and what, what are the things to look out for? Generic competition uh, is going to be a big issue, I think, particularly in the US, where the government has declared it wants to uh, kind of lift some of the barriers to generic competition. Uh, new pricing mechanisms are going to potentially be needed for particularly the combination therapies in the immune oncology area. Uh, what we're seeing now is lots of drug combinations being approved where the actual individual drugs come from different manufacturers. So actually working out how to reimburse that is going to uh, need a little bit more creativity than we've seen. And uh, we have to mention, particularly as you can tell I'm from England, uh, we have to mention Brexit, which is definitely causing continuing uncertainty uh, in the UK and beyond. Uh, firstly, we don't know currently whether when the UK leaves the EU next year um, we will be still benefit from the harmonisation which exists in the European uh, drug approval process. Everyone kind of hopes so but actually nothing's really been worked out yet. And the other thing which UK pharmaceutical companies are reporting, although um, interestingly not many of them have announced a, a desire to leave the UK post Brexit, what they are reporting already is difficulty in recruitment. Um, Usually they are recruiting lots of people from outside of the UK and from elsewhere in Europe. And there's definitely been a massive slowdown, not just in the pharma industry, but generally uh, people are reporting that some pe residents of other EU countries are increasingly reticent to relocate to the UK. So this could potentially have quite a big effect, uh, not only on pharma, but on, on the health service that we, we enjoy over there. In technology... We expect to see the increasing rise of personalised medicine with improvements in cost effectiveness and sensitivity geno to genomic analysis, meaning a wide range of tests are beginning to emerge. Uh, and personalised medicine will improve response rates dramatically and make treatments much more effective and efficient. Uh, the rise of artificial intelligence is going to be a big issue for this year and companies will significantly scale their use of artificial intelligence via applications such as predictive customer engagement. And finally, another kind of slightly unknown factor is uh, the move of tech companies into pharma industry and, and whether they are potentially going to disrupt the industry. Uh, Amazon and Google could enter the fray. Uh, people are talking about whether Amazon will uh, enter the pharma industry just as a distributor, which obviously is something it's very good at, or whether it'll try and do something potentially more disruptive. So, something definitely to keep an eye on. And lastly, a quick look at uh, selected merger and acquisition activity. Already announced in 2018, we see Takeda has acquired Tygenix. Uh, Sanofi beat uh, Novo Nordisk to buy Ablinx. Uh, Bioverative also going to be acquired by Sanofi. Uh, Celgene is buying the cancer drug developer Impact Biomedicines. And Biochrist and Idera are set to merge. And our next speaker is going to tell you a whole lot more about deals, so we'll look forward to that. But that is the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your, uh, your attention today, and I think we can take some questions.